everyone. All right, got it. Go. All right, so it's an honor to uh, introduce today's guest speakers. Um, we'll start with Dr. Maxwell and Becker Larson to talk about the known and PASD partnership. And then hear from Shelly Zolman with the Port Angeles Education Foundation. Um, these three community members are doing incredible things for our families and our students in the district. So it's an honor to have them here today. Uh, first, we have Dr. Maxwell. He's the CEO of the North Olympic Healthcare Network. Uh, Dr. Maxwell attended medical school at the University of Washington and did his family medicine residency at the UW affiliate in Spokane. He started practicing primary care and high risk OB in 1991 as a partner at the family medicine, a family medicine of Port Angeles. Dr. Maxwell led efforts to transform the private group practice into a federally qualified community health center uh, known as known in 2016, and he was hired as the CEO. Uh, he retired from clinical practice in July after 30 years. And a fun fact about Dr. Maxwell is he always wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> and then also with us today is Becca Larson. Uh, she is the family navigator for the Port Angeles School District. Uh, Becca graduated from Utah State University with a bachelor's in social work from the University of Utah uh, with a master's in social work. Uh, Becca has worked in pediatric medical social work and nonprofit settings providing parenting education and support. And she's been with the district since 2019. Uh, she loves her position as a family navigator because of the opportunity she has to build relationships with parents, school staff, and now known. Uh, Becca has two adorable kids who bop around the office every now and then, so it's really neat to see them, uh, uh, four years old and eight years old. She has a dog and a husband. Uh, Becca's family loves playing sports and being outside. And a fun fact about Becca is she's taking an online watercolor class, and she also enjoys playing the flute. So I'd like to start by welcoming and hearing from Dr. Maxwell. Great, thank you, everybody. And Becca, I, I'm sorry, I, I, uh, uh, we should have coordinated our, our uh, comments. So I'm, uh, uh, if I'm talking too long or you wanna jump in, just tell me to shut up and just kind of pop in. I'll try and be uh, expedient in my comments uh, this morning. Great. Uh, uh, and Carmen, I have a, a PowerPoint. So am I able to share the screen? Please. So, John, were you able to give Dr. Maxwell sharing capabilities? If you hit share screen, Dr. Maxwell, you might it might show you. It says uh, disabled right now. Okay. Um, try, I'm working on it here. Okay. Thank you. I'm not seeing what did oh Michael Maxwell okay. Okay, I made you a co-host. I think you can share now. Yes, wonderful. Thank you. Let's see if I can get this actually. Is that right? Think of all the all this stuff I've had to do on uh, Zoom. I have this down cold by now. And looks great. Oh. We lost you. <laughs> I was there. I was so close. One more time. How's that look? Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. It's, it's nice to see that uh, uh, it's not just physicians and teachers that are keeping these hours, so that um, I, I feel less lonely. Um, let's see. Let's get that one. So I'm just going to start uh, just by uh, thanks for the introduction to uh, Carmen. It's uh, better than what I would have done for myself. Uh, uh, I think a good place to start with our organization, I just wanna give you a little bit of background about North Olympic Healthcare Network for those who aren't familiar with this and before I focus on, on the collaboration with the school district. Um, I think always a good place to start with uh, organization is this mission and uh, it's to provide patient-centered, quality-driven, whole person healthcare services that are accessible to everyone in our community. But I wanna give you just a little bit of background about how we got there. As uh, Carmen mentioned, um, uh, so we're a, a 501c3 not-for-profit, fairly qualified community health center. And, and uh, we became that in 2015 after transforming our 40-year private practice, Federal Medicine for Angeles. Um, I see some people on the call uh, were actually patients of, of the clinic for a long time, and it's good to see familiar faces. Um, <clears throat> uh, we, uh, for those who uh, remember back in 2014 in Port Angeles, if you did not have a doctor, you were not gonna find one. There just were not enough primary care for, uh, 
providers in town. And so uh, it, back in 2015, we were at a kind of crossroads and tried to decide what we wanted to do for the community. And the model we were using was just not going to work for the long run uh, for the community. So we elected to uh, transform ourselves to a community health center by applying for this uh, uh, opportunity through the uh, Health Resource Service Administration for uh, a grant to uh, that's available to uh, uh, medically underserved populations or health professional service areas. It's a com uh, competitive grant process that there were about um, 164 uh, grants uh, available in the country, 2,000 applicants, and we were one of those 164. So we uh, uh, turned ourselves into a new entity uh, called North Olympic Health uh, Network. Uh, and the reason we did this is because we thought this model would help us uh, better address both the immediate and long-term healthcare uh, uh, access needs that we're, we're plaguing our community. Uh, it's a better reimbursement model I'm not gonna go in, into uh, uh, today. There were recruitment incentives to help us attract uh, more providers to, uh, to our rural area. Uh, and that was a, a big advantage. Uh, a really important one that's relevant for today is that uh, th this model supports a, uh, a um, uh, expanded scope of services that can make available to our patients that we could not as a private practice. It also positions us to be a, 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 in a better position to, um, to provide medical education, which also goes into the, the workforce pipeline. So a health center, you may see these terms, an FQHC, our federally qualified health center or community health center, they're synonymous terms, they mean the same thing. So when you see them, uh, uh, think of them as a, the same uh, um, entity. The health center program began in 1964 as an extension of the civil rights movement uh, based on the concept that healthcare was a basic human right. Uh, and there were, uh, this program was, was developed to address medically underserved populations, particularly inner city, urban and rural uh, like, like Los Angeles. Uh, the legislation was signed by President Johnson and has been getting consistent bipartisan support ever since with a big expansion of the Affordable Care Act back in 2010. And that's the expansion that uh, wave that, that uh, North Olympic um, uh, came in on. Uh, collectively, there's about 1,400 health centers uh, nationwide in all, uh, in all 50 states. There's 27 in, in uh, Washington state. Collectively, we take uh, care of about 30 million people, 8 million of those are kids, and over a quarter million are veterans. Uh, uh, collectively, we're the largest healthcare um, uh, network in the country. Health centers were the very first to, um, <clears throat> all the way back in 64, to have this radical idea that, that people should be able to get access to care in one integrated place, not scattered uh, around, but, but rather in one medical home where you get your primary care, behavioral health needs, uh, dentistry, uh, maternity needs, pediatrics, um, uh, all in one place. Health centers also provide uh, nurse care managers to take care of uh, patients, stay in contact between their visits, I have patient navigators to help break down non-medical barriers to care, provide pharmacy and vision services often, and, and really focus on preventive care. Um, <clears throat> a very important part, which uh, is that the DNA of health centers is collaboration. Unlike private practices that are kind of focused inward on taking care of just of the people that they've got um, in their four walls, health centers are outwardly oriented, where we look to uh, work with partners to identify needs and, uh, and help address those needs uh, in a collaborative fashion. <clears throat> After becoming a health center, uh, we really accomplished some really important goals that we set out to do, and that was we got more uh, medical providers in town. We've recruited 11 uh, new physicians since uh, 2015, uh, including uh, eight new um, uh, nurse practitioners or physician assistants. With that, we've been able to take care of uh, 10,000 new patients uh, that were previously without uh, medical uh, access. Um, uh, and that was the most, grat for me as a, as a medical provider, it was the most gratifying thing to be able to say yes, instead of having to say no, that we just, there was no room. We've been able to, these are people who have not had access to care prior to this. Uh, gone from 5,000 to over 15,000 active patients. About a third of them are on Medicaid, um, uh, representative of our community, we're about 35% Medicare. The rest are commercial or uninsured. Um, as a safety net provider for the uninsured, uh, we have a sliding discount uh, program where uh, uh, people can have their, their charges reduced all the way down to zero based upon their household size and income. Uh, a very important part of what we can now offer is an integrated behavioral health uh, services. Uh, we have uh, 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 counselors and psychiatrists. Uh, there's a lot of depression, anxiety in primary care in general. It's been particularly uh, acute uh, with the pandemic. 
Uh, we offer medication assisted treatment uh, for opioid use disorder. When uh, we provide dental care now, we have a dental clinic that provides access to patients with Medicaid. Typically, uh, uh, patients with Medicaid, particularly if you're an adult, uh, uh, only about 25% of those people have ever access dental care because they can't find anybody to take their insurance. Uh, but we will we, uh, see patients with Medicaid. We also provide uh, uh, medical education resources with a residency uh, with the University of Washington uh, or with Swedish and, and OMC. We uh, take on medical students and uh, we're a training site for medical assistance at the, from the college. Uh, but what we really want to focus on is, is our expanded community cl uh, collaborations and the most you know, really important and impactful one that we're involved with now is, is our collaboration with the school district. Um, <clears throat> we started out at the high school back in 2017 we, uh, through some outreach services to the high school at the request of uh, the uh, PA Citizens Action Network. They approached us uh, back then uh, identifying a problem at the high school at that time a lot of um, decreased graduation rates, uh, uh, absenteeism, uh, students having uh, a difficulty attending classes because of uh, illnesses or, or behavioral issues. And they asked us uh, if we could bring some services to, uh, to the high school. And so we, it was new for us and we, um, we uh, uh, hoped to be able to uh, uh, provide something that could help improve student success and, and improve graduation rates. Uh, initially it was sort of a variable hours. In fact, in our very first, um, uh, the, I think the first few months, uh, we were actually in a, literally in a closet uh, in the, the outside the nurse's room um, as we were trying to figure out how to get this thing off the ground. Um, and uh, um, it's been a learning experience ever since. The, the, the first two uh, years, uh, uh, we learned some important lessons. Uh, first was that, you know, medical services uh, relative to others are, are underutilized. And, and that's for a number of reasons. Mostly, you know, kids in general don't get sick that often. Uh, but they're particularly, they're not uh, immediately trustful. You know, they don't just uh, walk into a stranger and, and if you're not familiar with it, they're not going to access those services. Um, uh, you know, not being able to really be connected and, and uh, have the students know who we are, what we are doing, uh, really um, um, led to not a whole lot of utilization on the medical side. It was, although it was fairly low volume, I think it was about the first uh, couple of years, about 100 medical patients uh, over the uh, school year. They were actually pretty high impact. These were pretty important uh, um, uh, interactions with kids that, that had a big impact on themselves and their, their, their families. So it's, it was an adjustment uh, going from, um, you know, our focus is not really high volume, but really high, high impact. <clears throat> it was, really struck us that uh, the uh, biggest need was behavioral health. And I think anybody who's in education uh, knows that, that that's, uh, that's true. And it's really become much more so in recent years. Um, we also learned that the, the needs extended far beyond the, the high school. Uh, there were middle school, elementary schools, uh, th their students, particularly with behavioral health issues, were having um, uh, really need help almost more in the high school. So the teachers were trying to find ways of, you know, driving students up to the high school to get services. And, and it was just uh, very uh, uh, clunky and, and not ideal. Uh, and then, uh, um, the, Marty Brewer had a great idea to try and help um, uh, basically connect students with the services that we offer and others offer by uh, having someone like Becca on site. So uh, I think Becca came on in 2019 uh, and it had just a, a profound impact on helping students uh, to understand about what services are available. And uh, she understood what could help uh, make those uh, connections. So based upon those, uh, ex those learned experiences, we. Uh, proposed to make some adjustments in what we were doing going forward. And we really wanted to increase our availability um, uh, uh, and increase our presence more generally uh, throughout the district, increasing access uh, beyond just the high school, uh, particularly for behavioral health services. And uh, I really wanted to uh, uh, expand the Family Navigator um, uh, uh, program. Uh, I, I tried to find a way to, to clone Becca, uh, but we didn't have the resources and just didn't have the time. So we decided to, to go a different, little different route uh, with some additional funding. So we proposed to the uh, school district um, back in 2019 a, a, a mobile service model. And uh, when we first, I remember the, the look on the school district's face when I, I said, they had this vision of driving up in a white van, you know, uh, and it looks very sinister, you know, uh, and we had to explain to them, no, that's not what this is. And, and uh, but once it uh, uh, got them familiar with what we were proposing, they were very enthusiastic. Um, so we get, 
got into with their uh, approval and um, uh, enthusiasm, we decided to, to really look into the, how to best deliver uh, care with, with this model. Looked at various vendors and designs, um, had to develop a capital budget, and then to come up with funding. Uh, it, it's, uh, it was an ex expensive proposition, about $400,000 is what it took to uh, uh, pull this together. And we uh, had to, you know, we didn't have uh, that just laying around there in our couch cushion. So we had to go out and find some uh, grants uh, to help with um, uh, capital investment. We uh, got some uh, grants from HRSA, as well as some uh, contributions, donations from uh, uh, healthcare partners and uh, a private health foundation that we uh, applied for a grant for and put that together to to get us where we were, uh, where we got to. We initially planned on about a nine to 12 month construction of the, of the mobile health unit and planned to have it in service in January of 21. Uh, but of course, COVID hit and uh, really disrupted not only uh, the, uh, disrupted the school year, but also just the construction. It, it delayed things uh, all the way uh, almost uh, 10 months until October 20, uh, uh, 2021. And, it got delivered to us uh, at the end of uh, October, and we started operations at, uh, with the school on November 8th. Um, and this, you may have seen it around town. It's, it's, it's not a white Chevy van. It's, uh, it's actually a 38 foot um, um, uh, uh, commercial Winnebago at, uh, that is designed specifically for uh, commercial purposes. Uh, at, and uh, it's kind of hard to miss. It's a, it's a, it's a billboard on wheels. So uh, um, if, if you, you can't miss it, uh, the inside is it's uh, uh, often not what people expect. It is a uh, it looks and feels like a true uh, clinical space. Uh, it uh, uh, has three separate uh, spaces within it to provide uh, uh, counseling as well as uh, be, um, um, uh, medical dental services. So what we offer, um, I'm trying to watch for time. Uh, do you okay on time? Okay. All right. Great. I, I, one of my, yeah, you're good. one of my great faults is I talk very fast and, and uh, it's coming, coming handy uh, this morning. Um, <clears throat> so the services is we provide uh, primary medical care. So we take care of uh, uh, illnesses. Uh, so if, you know, kids have uh, headaches or stomach pain or some hurts and it's, you know, not sure if they, uh, um, you know, uh, need to go home or wonder what's going on, we can evaluate them for the medical illnesses. They have minor injuries. We're not really equipped for, for if someone comes in with a, you know, a, a <clears throat> laceration, uh, but for uh, minor injuries, we can assess those and get them to the right uh, areas for definitive care if necessary. Providing well child uh, visits and sports physicals, especially around uh, 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 sports time, uh, can be very helpful for getting kids um, um, to be able to participate. For the immunizations, education, and drug and tobacco use, prevention and counseling are um, some of the primary services. Behavioral health, uh, we actually provide one-on-one -on -one counseling uh, within the uh, mobile health uh, clinic. Um, our counselors are, are there uh, treating depression, anxiety, assessing suicide risk and helping address conduct disorders. We um, will be providing dental care on a, on a less frequent basis. About monthly, we plan on uh, uh, being at the various sites to provide oral health screenings. Uh, uh, education, some fluoride treatments, and possibly uh, sealants. Uh, we're not really equipped to do. It's not a full dental clinic on wheels. It's more of just uh, more of an assessment. If uh, we can do referrals uh, uh, for uh, for treatment for uh, for cavities if, uh, if they're identified. Um, we're uh, to kind of meet our goals. We really want to be everywhere in the school district, not just the high school. And so uh, having a clinic on wheels lets us be uh, at all elementary, middle, and high school uh, sites uh, uh, on a rotating basis uh, over the month. Uh, uh, we've initially designed things to be at, at where there's thought to be more need. So at the middle school and at the uh, high school, um, we're there more often, I think twice a week, and at the elementary schools on a rotating basis uh, uh, once a week. Uh, we're, the nice thing about this is uh, we can adjust based upon the demand. If, if things change, if one school is having uh, more trouble, we can adjust the schedules to uh, um, provide more services more frequently. Uh, in addition to providing one-on-one -on -one counseling, the, the uh, behavioral health uh, staff are also providing expanded services to students and parents through uh, evidence-based prevention and educational interventions, as well as eventually doing group level interventions. And we're really happy to, to be able to find some uh, financial support to expand uh, the uh, school family navigators. 
Um, uh, you know, we wish there were more Beccas, but, uh, but there's only one of her, but we've, uh, the, the school's found a way to kind of leverage her knowledge with additional staff and, uh, and make those, um, help make those connections at, all the, at the sites um, with services. So the uh, services are available to all students and school staff. Uh, it can be pre-scheduled or on a walk-in basis. Um, the uh, uh, Beck and her team can help uh, facilitate and coordinate the load of the schedules and how to, you know, which kids might need uh, help for what services and can help get them scheduled with us or other uh, providers in the community if that's uh, preferred or more convenient. Uh, we recommend uh, uh, pre-registration and consenting by parents um, uh, with a during the uh, ahead of time, uh, so that I think there's registration materials in the uh, school packets at the beginning of the year. Uh, but parents can uh, consent and register anytime. Um, they're they, they're encouraged to do it ahead of time just a bit to to make things easier. But they can be done at the time of visit, uh, their first visit, if that's uh, uh, if that's necessary. The parent does not need to be present if those consents are signed ahead of time. They don't have to be present uh, for the kid uh, to uh, to get services. Uh, although parents are often encouraged by behavior, behavioral health staff to attend uh, those visits, because often that's uh, those are kind of key um, relationships. We follow Washington State law uh, 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 regarding health care of minors and consents. Uh, 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 state law says that minors can self-consent for emergencies, for birth control services, or pregnancy care. And they can also self-consent uh, at 13 years of age or older for behavioral conditions like depression or anxiety. Uh, parental consent is required otherwise for non-emergency medical care and immunizations. Uh, so looking forward, we're, we're, you know, this is, um, it's a new program for, for uh, us and the school district. We're, um, you know, if we got it right first thing out of the gate, that'd be a, a shock. So we realize we're going to be kind of watching to, to assess, you know, uh, utilization patterns, uh, outcomes, and how satisfied that uh, students and parents are with the, uh, with the services, and we'll make adjustments as needed uh, in the uh, services and the frequency as um, and our, as our resources allow uh, to make sure that those needs are getting met as they, as they evolve and, and change. We expect over time that, that uh, as uh, students and parents and, and school staff get more familiar with our presence, and it's kind of hard to miss us in the, in the uh, big Winnebago, uh, that they'll get more comfortable over time and, and utilization will, uh, will increase uh, uh, to meet all their needs and basically uh, hope to improve student physical and emotional health over time. And that's all I got. Hopefully I left Becca and Shelly some time. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Maxwell. And I know Becca does have to take off to take uh, Noah, one of her kiddos to school. So Becca, can you just do a quick yes. little intro about um, you know, what you do and how you connect with families in our, in our district? Yes, hi, can you guys hear me okay? Okay, great. Sometimes it doesn't work on this computer. Um, I, I first just want to say how much I love this program. Um, so my job is split up into several different parts. So I work with families who are experiencing homelessness and getting their kids connected to um, transportation and free and reduced lunch, um, and then housing resources, all of that. I work with kids in foster care and coordinate with case managers to make sure that their educational needs are getting met too. And then the third part is working with the known clinic. And, and it's one of my favorite parts because it allows me to be creative and also build relationships with people who are very invested in the community, including teachers who have um, such concern about their students, especially now as we are seeing many of our students experiencing more anxiety and depression and um, difficulty accessing mental health services because of um, the lack of providers in our community. And so I feel like the mobile health clinic has really filled a huge gap and has allowed students not only to see a counselor, um, but also to see one quickly. So it reduces that wait time. And because of the relationship that I've been able to build with Known, we can receive referrals and then at sometimes schedule behavioral health appointments for the very next day. And so I think um, parents really appreciate that um, and, and also school staff. Um, so I, I do have to take Noah to school. He's at Franklin and he gets very upset if he's late. 
<laughs> but I do want to share just a quick story. Um, I have so many stories about how big of an impact this has meant for our families, but um, the one that is most meaningful right now to me or sticks out the most is a, a family who are two children. They're in elementary school and um, for various reasons, really complex reasons, they aren't living with their um, parent. And so it's, it's been a struggle. They've, um, they're living with someone who doesn't have any kind of legal guardianship and, um, state law allows me as the homeless student liaison to consent for medical and behavioral health services for kids who are unaccompanied minors and working with known, we were able to get those students behavioral health care, um, and medical care too, because the person that they're living with didn't know who their medical provider was, was having some struggles getting them um, signed up for care. Uh, so this has been, it's been huge and it's meant um, the world to some of these kids who haven't had care otherwise. Um, so I really appreciate it. I, I think that it it's going to just keep growing and um, we are serving the middle school. Most of our clients right now are from the middle school and that's a really difficult age. We know a lot of changes going on there for those students. And so we're just, it's, it's amazing to see how targeted and how flexible it can be as we see the need change or as we better understand what the needs are in the community. And I love working with the known staff. Um, I really appreciate um, how well they communicate with us and um, how creative they are. It's been a really great experience for me. So thank you all for letting me be here. And um, okay, I gotta go. Thanks, thank Becca. Awesome. All right. Do we have any questions or comments for Dr. Maxwell? Looks like Kathy. Um, Dr. Maxwell, has the mobile program um, had any hand in helping um, diagnose early cases of COVID in, in, the, in our kids? Uh, we actually have the uh, capacity to do rapid testing on the, on the mobile unit. So uh, it's available. The way the school uh, the way I understand is the school already has access to their own testing, uh, uh, rapid testing, and so we haven't really been the primary source for that. But uh, if a if a student uh, has symptoms, and the, uh, I think the the school district protocols are to for the school itself to to test the kids, uh, and if um, um, and if the, uh, the kid is positive and needs a medical evaluation, they can send us to us uh, for treatment. Um, if we see somebody who they, they um, weren't sure about and did not get tested, we can go ahead and test the, the child on, on, the, uh, on the unit. I have a question. Um, how well do you think the community has, how well or how rapidly do you think the community has learned about this program um, in terms of it becoming general knowledge as a, uh, uh, a resource for the general community? Uh, we think, uh, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's hard to miss it. You know, like I said, it's a billboard on wheels. Uh, so at least uh, they're aware of the unit. Uh, presented to the EDC, I think it's where, uh, where Kathy actually uh, became aware of it uh, the, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and which led to an article in the PDN. Uh, so it, um, I think that spread the word. Uh, we'll be on KLMP uh, next week to kind of talk about this as well. Uh, so it's getting out there. It's, it's a new program, you know, uh, less than a month in, in uh, operations, uh, but we're kind of steadily getting the word out. We do have some uh, billboards um, uh, uh, planned uh, to uh, further kind of get the word out. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, thank you again, Dr. Maxwell, for coming on and sharing your story and partnering with the district. We really appreciate you and your team. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. And so um, we'll, we're, we'll pop on over to Shelly Zolman, uh, do a quick little intro for our next presentation. Um, so we, uh, Shelly Zolman with the Port Angeles Education Foundation. Uh, Shelly is the new public relations director for PAEF and is the graduate of Port Angeles High School and the University of Washington. Uh, she lived in northern Idaho for the past 20 years and recently relocated back to PA. Uh, she's owned a web design company since 2000, and in the last eight years, uh, she managed a nonprofit in North Idaho promoting organizations that serve children and families. Um, upon arrival back to PA, she accepted a job with the Port Angeles, Educa Educa Ella, excuse me, Port Angeles Education Foundation and also Prevention Works recently. Uh, so she has many hats, um, and she's doing the same public relations outreach 
and networking task uh, she's been doing in Northern Idaho, which is here on the peninsula. A fun fact about Shelly is she was, uh, this is awesome. She was one of a six girl tuba line in high school and went to the Fiesta Bowl. So that was really cool. So welcome Shelly, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's kind of neat to be, it's neat to be back in PA and I was just noticing, um, I went to school with some Parats and some Gothams. And so I feel like, you know, I'm even though I've been gone for a long time, I've still got my roots here. So um, essentially, um, and I, I, I can be pretty quick. So the Port Angeles Education Foundation has been around for about 30 years. And I'm going to, I'm going to read just two things and then I'm just going to wing it. Um, so our mission is to re, um, remove barriers for individual students, fund innovative education experiences, and provide scholarships to make post-secondary you know, secondary education accessible. So those are kind of our three tiers of what the foundation does. Um, I wanted, so I wanted to start with this little story that kind of sets it up for, the, for, for our grant process. So um, this is from a biology teacher. He, this was his grant report um, after the foundation was able to purchase some binoculars for his bio, biology class. He says, when we returned to in-person learning last spring, the tone of our classrooms could simply be described as awkward. It was like starting over when everyone met in person. By the fourth week of second semester, three of my students had failed to begin any of their online assignments. Uh, once we started the PAEF funded project in week five, two of the three students made an enormous effort to get their grades caught up and finish the semester with high marks. Though the third student never caught up with his online assignments, he was fully engaged in the project activities, interacted with his classmates and teacher in a positive way and gained a richer understanding of the natural world. So that's just like one little snippet um, of our SPICE grants. SPICE uh, stands for Supporting Projects of Innovation, Creativity, and Excellence. So we have a grant process that's, that's due in October, and we just recently funded over $50,000 of SPICE grants to over 20 teachers um, in, in things as little as like um, seating for, for kids who are, you know, like, I can't, what's the word? Um, inclusive, flexible seating. Um, we did a gaga ball pit at Dry Creek Elementary. We did um, wireless mics. We've done funding for the Stevens Marching Band Project. So just teachers are able to, I mean, and it's kind of like shoot, shoot, shoot for the moon. And um, a lot of teachers are, are getting to do things with their students that they would not have the opportunity to do. So field trips, just experiences, just, you know, ex exciting stuff. So that's one of our cool things. Um, scholarships is our big one. And I, I always laugh because when I came on board, I didn't realize that the foundation has taken over um, basically the scholarship notebook process. And I just, I hearken back to the eighties when we were literally doing green scholarship notebooks, you know, for, you know, to turn in and they circulated around the community. Well, the foundation now kind of takes that, has taken that process over. And in last year, they awarded over $260,000 in scholarships from, I think it's about almost two dozen permanent and, um, you know, temporary funds from, you know, the community that they have set up. So that was, that was a majority actually of the local scholarships given last year. So that's a pretty cool thing. And We've got some taskmasters and amazing people in that process. And I just had a meeting yesterday at the high school with some of those counselors over there. So, um, so yeah, so scholarships, SPICE grants. And then we also, throughout the year, last year we helped over 70 kids with things like school uniforms and ASB cards and eyeglasses and gym uniforms and toiletries. And so, so we are available throughout the year for you know, basic you know, needs that just are, are not being met elsewhere. So 
um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. We um, kind of hopefully fill the gap where, you know, all of a sudden there's a need. And um, so grants, scholarships, and then helping kids throughout the year. And if you're interested in how you can help, I will put my contact information in the comments. But yeah, it's it's, it's great. I'm so excited. You know, everybody loves edu you know, it's, it's really great to fill the gap for those kids that need it. And then also to help further education and help teachers, um, especially kind of coming out of COVID, um, do things with their kids that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So that's really all I have. Questions? <laughs> Some Shelly. So I didn't even know that you guys took over the scholarship um, task. So so thank you for doing that. Uh, it's a big a big lift, and we're really grateful and excited to have you back on the peninsula. Thank you. Yeah. Any questions or comments for Shelly? Oh, it looks like Kathy. <laughs> oh, I think you're on mute. Do you have contact information? Um, my my sons went through the school system in in the um, to early two thousands, and I wasn't aware of this whole involvement. And I think it's just awesome, and that you're getting the information out. So if you could um, send the confirm the information, um, I'll send it out to the rest of the club. That's good. Yeah, I put my um my I put the website, my email address, and my phone number in the chat. And then Carmen, I've been working with Carmen. We've probably talked weekly <laughs> or so, just be, you know to see because I'm I'm like diving back into the community and because I need to know I like big picture and I like to understand. And like for instance, where we just the caring for kids Christmas project coming up, the foundation's going to donate some you know some some funding <laughs> for, for last minute you know like socks or underwear that that might you know if, if there's a gap once we've collected things from the community. So yeah, I wanna, I am happy to know. And I'm also with my prevention works position. I, I just wanna know what's going on out there. So I'm happy to be a resource and a, a um, liaison for the, for the you know, between the foundation and, and what we can do. Awesome, great. Well, thank you again, Shelly. We really appreciate you being here with us this morning. All right, well, uh, that wraps up our presentations for the day. Thank you to our presenters. And let's hand it back over to Scott. Thanks, Carmen. Uh, Rob, can you do me a favor and, and put your phone number on the chat? Because March Prot's trying to get a gift, uh, the gift card book to you. So uh, if you could just do that, so Bill, or send a message directly to Bill so they get a hold of you. So Dr. Maxwell, Becca, and Shelly, thank you so much. You're, uh, your service to our kids is absolutely fantastic. Very much appreciated. I enjoy and Dr. it. Max, yeah, and Dr. Maxwell, just on a personal note, uh, with your North Olympic uh, Health Network, my mom is a, one of your patients, and it's, it's absolutely incredible the, the support you all provide uh, in two ways specifically. Well, three ways. Dr. Weller is, is absolutely incredible. Yes. Uh, providing service to my mom, really fantastic lady. Uh, but when I've had questions about anything I, I call your your network there and your your call center and they get right back to me and answer questions very professionally and give me guidance on what to do and then also when my mom's in the hospital you know you've always got the floating doctor that comes in and you know representing your your network to so i i, I really appreciate everything you're doing so well thanks uh, for the feedback scott yeah yeah appreciate and, it. and the care what y'all are doing for our students is fantastic so thank you, thank you very much for your time so um this Thursday, uh, 9th of December, over at Roosevelt. Hope to see everybody at 5 o'clock. Bring your ugly sweater. Uh, so we have the competition there. And as you saw, I'm, I'm taking it very formally and I, I'm, I'm chairing that. And, and it'll be 